Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Thank you, Ralph, and hi, everybody. My name's Sandy, and I'm an alcoholic. They indulged me and got me a bar stool to sit on. (laughs) Standing on my knees just is uh, getting painful, so I think I, I can see everybody from here, so I think this is working okay. I agree with uh, Holly. This is indeed a uh, wonderful assortment of uh, perspectives on spirituality that we've got assembled here. <clears throat> and um, when I talk about uh, the steps, I really um, don't talk about how to do them or how I sponsor someone to do them. I um, Lately, I've been talking about what I see as a result of the steps and how everything looks to me now. In other words, I have, uh, after 43 years, a different perception on many, many things than I used to have. And Clancy points out that um, alcoholism is a disease of perception. And I would submit that all of life is a matter of perception. That every time we're disturbed, our perception is incorrect. And we go to a friend who helps us see it differently, and the matter is resolved. And so I'm, I'm going to start with a um, different frame of reference. I ended up with Bob's steps, uh, I, so I ended up with five steps. And I want to uh, discuss all of them from this same vantage point and then look how they fit into the uh, setup that I use. And I think I'll start out by saying that a couple of weeks ago I was in Rapid City, South Dakota, And uh, one of the sites out there, of course, is Mount Rushmore. But the other site, even more interesting, is where the Lakota Indian tribe decided to create a monument of, of similar magnitude of their highest spiritual Indian, Crazy Horse. And uh, they chose the most sacred mountain that they had out there. And I don't have... <clears throat> the date exactly right, but maybe about 25 years ago, they saw the work of a Polish sculptor from the East Coast, and they liked it very much. And so they contacted him, and he came out, met with the tribe, they showed him the mountain, and they asked him if he would like to tackle this. And he said yes. And he started out all by himself down at the bottom of the mountain. He built a little tent. He had hand tools, and he'd climb up six or 700 feet with a star drill and a striking hammer and a supply of dynamite and a vision of what this would eventually look like. And uh, after all these years, um, he eventually built a house. He got married, had 10 kids. Um, someone gave him an old compressor that you had to start with a crank, and they still have it there in the museum. And uh, in the movie describing the activities of the last 25 years or so, it shows him trying to start that thing with the crank in the morning. And finally, he'd get it going. He'd start dragging the hose up to run the pneumatic uh, drills. He'd get up 300 feet or so, and he'd hear the thing quit. And... <laughs> 
I had to go all the way down, start it up again. He'd stand there and stare at it for a couple of minutes and go, okay. And then sometimes he'd get all the way up and be drilling for two minutes, and then, boop, it would quit. And so you can see the commitment um, that he had. And the, the head is finished, and he's on a horse. It'll be 50 more years. And he's passed away, and his uh, widow and um, eight of the ten children are totally committed to this um, project, and so it's really quite interesting to look at and to realize um, how much was done and how sacred that is. Now, the interesting thing for me was that the um, movie was narrated by one of the um, elders of the Lakota tribe, and when they put his name up, and Chris remembered it, his name is Billy Mills, and sports fans will remember a Marine second lieutenant in the 1964 Olympics winning the 10,000 meters in Tokyo, much to the surprise of the entire world. And he ran something like 30 seconds faster than his previous best time. And so I was in the Marine Corps at the time, and he was just, you know, one of our heroes. So I listened very attentively to him. But here's the thing that he said that I think is so applicable, and we hear it in AA. He said, uh, the uh, Lakota Indians believe very deeply that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And then he went through the whole thing, and then as he was closing, he reminded everyone that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Now, when life or the program or anything is approached from that starting point, sometimes what we're looking at has an entirely different perspective than it did when we were just trying to get sober. In other words, there's, we, we all went through that and our sponsors help us, but then as we move along, and we get more comfortable, we realize what is happening is we are becoming more aware of that particular truth. And so the way I would like to look at these five steps is by going to what Scott pointed out so perfectly when he pointed out that all of this work in these 12 spiritual principles are designed to accomplish only one thing. There's not multiple objectives. There's just one thing, and that's a spiritual awakening. Now, how do you look at a spiritual awakening, and how do you look at these steps in contact with that? Now, the uh, I remember Johnny Carson had a thing called Karnak, <laughs> where Ed McMahon would bring the sealed envelopes out that had been on Funkin' Wagno's back porch for the last month under armed guard. You remember all that stuff? And in the envelope was the answer to a question. And Johnny, without knowing what that... I mean, in the envelope was the question. And Johnny, without knowing what the question was, would give the answer. In other words, he was going to do it backwards. Here's the answer. Now we're going to open it and see what the question was. And it was quite humorous. He would, uh, I remember one of them was, uh, he held the envelope up and he said, the answer to this question is frat house. And then he'd rip the envelope open. And the question was, what happens in Japan when a large boulder falls on a house? <laughs> frat house. <laughs> <laughs> So, if we started out by looking at it backwards, like that, where I tell you the solution, and then you surmise the problem. So, if I said that the solution is rat poison, you might conclude that the problem was somebody has rats in their house. Or if I said the solution is earplugs, you might go, I bet the problem is loud noises and they can't sleep. Or if I said bug spray, then you work backwards 
and you see what the problem is, there's a lot of bugs around. So now let's take spiritual awakening. What is the nature of a problem that spiritual awakening fixes? You can see that leads to a different chain of thought than you might normally have. It doesn't fix sobriety. That That's an incidental on the way. So it fixes the opposite of awakened. It would be unawakened. In other words... We, Scott pointed out, our problems are of our own making. All our problems are of our own making. How do you create a problem? You think about it. You just look at something, and you're sitting in here, and everybody else is sitting in here, and you go, it's too hot in here. And then you react to the thought, it's too hot. Oh, boy, I'm sweating. I'm, no, I'm very uncomfortable. I wish I wasn't here. I wish I wasn't here. There was no problem until you thought about. So every, if every problem that we've ever, ever had and ever will have are created by ourselves, what is the collection of all those problems? If we put them all together, what would we call that? I would call it our story. Our life story. And so if we look at um, Clancy was talking last night, and he said that somebody at his work made fun of his teeth being missing. And, boy, I related to that. I could, I could just feel how that would hurt and how painful it was. And so he lived with that story that he told himself about this oh, awful thing that happened. And then when he went back, and the man said, no, I was actually admiring the fact that you were way up at the top and came down, and now you're coming back, even though you don't have your teeth, which you'll get someday. And now we looked at the old story and saw that we had it wrong. We had it wrong. So as soon as he got rid of the old story by finding out the new story or the truth, he felt better about the whole thing. So the problem went away because he was able to look at the situation differently. And I had the same thing happen last year when I was out in California. I went to Clancy's group and then Brentwood. And uh, before the Brentwood group started, a guy uh, whose wife was getting the 30-year medallion told her that he thought he knew me. And he wanted to talk to me outside. And uh, I went out there and he said, um, in 1962, you were flying an F3T2Q radar plane in a flight of four on a cross country. You declared an oxygen emergency. All the planes had to land. There was nothing wrong with your oxygen. And the next day, you wouldn't get in the airplane and you never flew again. And I went, how do you know that? He said, I was in the plane with you. (laughs) It was staggering because um, we we had the photo planes, which were really high performance, and then this radar plane had two seats. And I thought that the radar guy was in the other seat, which is why I wasn't going to jump out because he wouldn't know how to fly it. I had to get out of that plane. I was just coming unglued, about to have a seizure or something. And um, and it was true. I got on the ground, and I'd been experiencing this for about six or seven months, and I just couldn't take it anymore. I knew I was going to explode inside of one of these planes. And so I went back to the squadron. He flew the plane back, and uh, I told the colonel, I can't do this anymore after 12, 13 years. And he said, well, we'll have to notify Headquarters Marine Corps, and then we'll have to wait and see what they want to do with you. You'll have to be retrained in some other specialty. And so it took about three months 
And during that three months, I came to work, and the only emotion I felt was shame. I had let these guys down. This was an exclusive squadron. This is my thing for all these years. I failed. I'm a piece of junk. And I could feel them. They let me do the legal work. And I could feel them as they went by my office. I hated to make eye contact with any of the pilots. But I could feel them looking in going, what a piece of junk. I could just feel it. And, boy, those three months couldn't go by fast enough for me to get out of there. It just hurt so much. And I've carried that all these years. And he says to me, did you know how popular you were in that squadron? Do you know how much everybody liked you? Oh, my God, the colonel was pulling every string he could to keep you on flying. We were trying this and we were trying that. And I went, really? <laughs> so I had to go back. Wow, that's uh, 40 years ago. No, this was 62, so, yeah, 45 years ago. And take that part of my life story and go, erase, 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 no shame. There wasn't anything like that that happened. <laughs> and substitute, they liked me, I was popular. <laughs> now, whenever I think about those years, I smile. So, the big book says, and I can't quote it exactly, the idea that someday, somehow, we'll be able to drink like other people is an illusion that per persists to the grave or something like that. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. The idea that somehow we can drink like others has to be smashed. So here's this idea that is part of our story. And we're being told to smash it. I think if we could simplify the whole program if somebody could come up with an idea smasher, <laughs> like an atom smasher, and go in and smash our whole story. Because as we get to the fifth step, and the fourth step was covered so well that we finally have been honest with ourselves and have faced things that we never faced before and we have them all down on paper and we're going to run this by someone else, much to our shame and chagrin. And as we do this, we are helped by our sponsor to see each incident differently. Something I thought was very, very important, turns out that I overreacted. Something that I could dismiss, I found was very serious. And as a result of this, I began to change my perception on my whole life story on that piece of paper. And the beginning of that is humility. It is the, the very beginning of humility, really, in this program after we go to detox. <laughs> is to acknowledge that maybe I'm not such an expert on me as I think. Imagine that. You aren't the biggest expert on you. Wouldn't you think you are? You live inside there. You would think you're the ultimate authority on what's going on in there. And yet, after one little episode, we find we're not so sure. And mostly we find things aren't as bad as we thought they were. And things are, and we aren't as bad as we thought we were. And so we're beginning to assemble all of the ideas that we're going to get rid of, which is six and seven. We're going to assemble everything about ourselves that we're going to get rid of. And in that process, 
What will be left is the truth. The real truth about our selves, which is what an awakening is. It is an awareness that things are quite different than I thought they were. The universe is different. The world is different. I'm different. And I go, how could have I, I have ever fallen for all that? Well, I was up against the biggest con artist you could find. <laughs> me. Who knows how to con me better than me? This time, I'm going to have just two beers. Yeah. I mean, how many times do you do that? You remember Lucy with the football on Thanksgiving and he'd come back again? This year? Oh, I know she won't pull it away. And I can't believe she pulled that football away. And I go, I can't believe I did it to myself again. And, and I would come up with this idea again. And I really see the, um, I don't think my ego is my enemy. It is the necessary part of me in order to have this human experience. It's the middleman between the spiritual entity and the human experience. It's how I have this so that I can see what it's like to not be just a spiritual entity. When I think of what the um, Billy Mills said, you have to realize that this doesn't start with the human experience. In other words, well, what was I before I had a human experience? Well, I was a spiritual being who hasn't had a spiritual experience. And when it finishes, what am I? I'm a spiritual being who just finished the human experience. But I am constant all the way through. And that I, or whatever we want to call it, is our true self. It is the nature that we've lost touch with because of the story we made up that we're a piece of junk. And then we feel the emotions of being a piece of junk, of being afraid. In other words, there was no fear. There was no resentment. There was no anger. Until we manufactured a world of our own making. Sometimes people will say, trying to put a derogatory term on somebody, well, she lives in her own little world. Did you ever say that about somebody? She lives in her own little world. Well, so do you. <laughs> and so do I. And no matter how well you may know someone else, you don't know their whole world. You don't know some of the fears that race by or some of the things that they are still using in order to ruin their own lives. And so as we look at this, we can see that the whole process of the 12 steps is to erase what's separating us, as Scott said, from our own creator. I like to think that I was just, why would a spiritual being, see, I'm making things up now. Why would a spiritual being have a human experience? What the heck is that all about? Why can't you just be out there and be part of the universe going, yeah, this is cool. I really enjoy this. <laughs> I really think it has to do with improving on the situation. And one of the ways that things get improved is by losing them and getting them back. The reborn is better than being born. The prodigal son, we're all on prodigal son and prodigal daughter journeys. And boy, do we take ourselves on some really winners, don't we? <laughs> I mean, we take it down there. We, we take it out to the extreme limits so that when that moment of clarity comes and we begin the journey back, we really appreciate the simple things in life. You lose all your possessions. You, I went through a few divorces. 
Very familiar with the, uh, where's that going? Oh, I guess you don't get to keep that. <laughs> and as they go, it feels like they're ripping part of your flesh away because that's who I was after all. That coin collection or that Japanese stuff that I got over there and all, whatever it was. And then when it's all gone, I realized I'm fine. I'm just me. That was stuff. And as we come back and get more stuff, it doesn't have that hold. It just is there. Oh, it's very nice and all that, but it is not part of who we are. And so I like to look at this journey back that AA is providing us through these set of spiritual principles. And so the fifth step, I'm only going to read one little thing. Um, he says, Thanks for the, he got me a book with big print. <laughs> <laughs> and it's right at the end of the fifth step. Whenever you read words like this, or like the tenth step promises, you realize you are hearing something other than psychological, common sense um, events. We're talking about the spiritual world. So these and the tenth step, prom- tenth step promises are like magic. You know, self-seeking will slip away. Woo, gone. Oh, boy. That is not a psychological process. Work with me for a year and self-seeking will slip away. One day you'll be in here and it'll be gone. So let's look at the results of this visit with our sponsor. And we've finished. We've covered everything. Once we've taken the step with holding nothing, we're delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Wow. Our fears fall from us. How about that? They aren't figured out. Nobody walked through them. They just went, bye. They fall. <laughs> we begin to fear the near, feel the nearness of our creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. So using the model that we started out with, we are beginning to awaken. This is what is happening. We're looking around and we see no reason to be afraid. Because the fearful world that we created isn't there anymore. You follow what I'm saying? It's like you're in the dark woods at night and you're going, oh, I'm full of fear. And then we go, only kidding, you're not in the dark woods, you're at the beach. Oh, okay. (laughs) And we're standing on the beach and the fears fall away. Because we're not in the world that we created. We're exiting it. We're on our way out from it. The feeling the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. Disappeared. You see these terms? Well, what happened to your drinking problem? I don't know. It disappeared. It was around here one day. And uh, I i don't know where it is. I think my neighbor has it. He, I was looking over there. And, and he's, he's having a terrible time. But I'm going to let him keep it. And then it closes. We are on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Now, if that isn't a breathtaking picture, if that is the picture that we allow to be of what life is all about, here's a hint on what life could be. It consists of walking down a broad highway hand in hand with our Creator, just walking along. Who could be afraid with all that big guy walking right next to me? Who could worry about how things are going to turn out when he's in charge? He's picking where we're going. He's walking down. I'm just going along like a little kid with his father. That's the way it's supposed to be. 
the problem with that picture, he gets all the credit <laughs> for everything. Oh, God has taken such a good care of you. Oh, look how happy God's making you. Look what God did to your little family. Look what this happened in your sober. Look what God got you this nice job. And pretty soon we're going, God? I'm getting sick of hearing about God. What about me? And the second we go, what about me? We start getting afraid again. And we start having resentments. Because things aren't going my way. My way. And so, when I was brand new, some, you know, and I, and I met Chuck Chamberlain, and I love him. He's my hero. I, all my perspectives come from stuff he has taught. But when, when I knew him in the 70s, and all the way up to 1980 or so, and went to his house and did all this, I just sat totally enthralled with everything he was saying, but I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. <laughs> but it, it felt wonderful. I just said, yeah, yeah, he sure knows that. And it, it just felt, it felt wonderful. So being able to walk hand in hand is so simple and so nice. Something's holding us from getting there. The mystery is why don't we do that? We just had this marvelous experience. Our sponsor revealed the real nature of our fourth step inventory, which is our story. Pretty much covers everything. I heard somebody a couple of weeks ago, they said, let's try this out. I'm, now I'm breaking my train of thought and I'll never get back to where I was. <laughs> they said, just imagine right now that you forgive every unkind thing, every unfair incident, every terrible thing anyone, anything, any government, any entity ever did to you. How do you think you'd feel? And I thought about that, and I went, there wouldn't be much left of me. That's who I am. I'm the memory bank of all unfairness. <laughs> wow. If I did that, I'd be the hole in the donut. There'd be no one home. On the contrary, I would be a spiritual being having a human experience. I'm the one that collected the garbage to go along this human experience. I was supposed to simply watch it. My higher power brought me down here for an 80-year movie. And I'm just supposed to go, oh, wow, look at that. Oh, man, oh, wow, yeah, yeah, this is good. <laughs> And you can't just have a movie of a waterfall and a palm tree. Mm. You got to have action. You got to have buses going off the cliff. You got to have bang, you're dead. Well, hey. Because after all, it's only a movie. I'm just throwing in a sideline. That's where I live. And it's. Uh, <laughs> and the problem is I'm at the movie picture yourselves you're at the movies okay and you have a favorite character in the movie this is your favorite person and they're sitting in a chair and this guy that doesn't like him is sneaking up behind him with a club and you're in the audience and you jump up and go watch out there's a guy behind you with a club it has no effect does it because it's a movie the guy on the movie, he doesn't know anything about that. He doesn't hear you in the audience. But that's what I feel like doing in controlling the world. I've got to fix that. I've got to fix that. I've got to fix that. And as Scott said, it just unfolds. The universe just unfolds. So I have no part in it? Yeah. My part is my reaction to it. That's my part. Free will gives me the ability to turn 
a peaceful afternoon into a seven-car accident. <laughs> and the director said, that's not what the scene was. I don't know how you got it into a... So anyway, what is blocking us from walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe? And now we come to a difference between the 12 and 12 in the big book. And I've been reading um, Ernest Kurtz a lot. I just love his history book, Not God. That's the best thing I've ever read about AA. And um, as you know, the uh, Oxford movement had the four absolutes. And the Cleveland intergroup still prints them. And they're very powerful. And there was a lot of pressure to include them in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I think the Akron crowd really wanted them, but the New York crowd, Bill in particular, he said, man, you, you throw perfection at a new alcoholic, you're going to drive himself crazy because half of us are perfectionists already. And the last thing we need is to be starting out going, perfect, I'm going to get, I'm gonna, if I'm not perfect, I'm no good. So he they didn't become part of our program. But he mentioned in the letter that he snuck them back in in the 12 and 12 in the sixth step. And so as we look at the sixth step, one of the, um, you, all you have to do is read it. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. So entirely means absolutely you take everything and uh, and remove all defects. So without thinking too hard, that means perfection. And Bill writes in there, we have to start raising our eyes towards perfection. So the big book is progress, not perfection, and now we're moving progress towards perfection, and we can understand what this means. No one, none of us, could become perfect. That's absolutely, there's no way, it's absolutely impossible. On the other hand, perfect help could make us perfect. In other words, perfect help is available. Our higher power is perfect love. And if we would allow that in, we could be all the way to the top. So why don't we do it? And that's the discussion of the sixth step. Why not? And it's just that, well, I gave up drinking. And I gave up having extramarital. And I gave up this. I got to keep something where I'm involved. And that's what he discusses. It's one of the lovely parts of spirituality is to understand why we are remaining this way. And it is our choice to not surrender more of the control of our lives. And he points out that we were granted absolute perfect release from alcohol. And the reason we were is because we became entirely ready to have that gone. That was killing me. But gossip doesn't kill you. And greed doesn't kill you like alcohol does. It ruins our lives, but it doesn't kill us. And since it's not fatal, we compromise. And we settle for as much perfection as will get us by. Right out of the 12 and 12. And so, I use a routine about... um, the seven deadly sins. So why don't we start with lust? How many about, well, how, who would like 100% relief from lust? Oh, not too many hands. One, two. <laughs> we have a few saints that are sitting out there, but hands started like this. No, wait a minute. Wait, wait. <laughs> what would perfect release from, what would that be? Dead? Dead. That's what it is. You're dead. You have no lust left. None. Now, I agree. It's causing me a lot of problems. I'd like to get rid of most of it. Most. What is most? Well, you know, put me down for 80%. But 
不是他说的，不是。And years ago, a friend of mine, Bill Hatch, he's passed away. He gave me a C.S. Lewis little story that covers this, and it was the、um, and I've told it quite a few times, but it does fit in here.、Um, the little ten, eleven-year-old boy has a big, important baseball game the next day, and the, the team is in the finals, and this is crucial. And the coach gives the team only one instruction. Go to bed early, eat a nice meal, and get eight hours sleep. If you guys are that rested, we're going to do great. So the kid came home, he told his mother, "Got to eat early." Went to bed at the prescribed time, went to sleep, and he'd been asleep about three hours, and he woke up with a little toothache starting. And he went ooh, and he could feel it, and he knew if he called his mother for a couple aspirin, she would give them to him, and he'd go right back to sleep. But he didn't call her. He kept waiting, thinking it could go away. Maybe it'll go away. And he sucks air around it. Ooh, no, it's still there. Okay, maybe a little while, a little while, a little while. And he actually delays about an hour and a half before he calls his mother, who brings him the two aspirin, and he falls back asleep. But he didn't get the eight hours thing, and he makes an error and whatever. So the moral dilemma is: Why didn't he call his mother right away? He knew she'd give him the two aspirin. And the answer was that he knew she wouldn't stop there. She would give him the two aspirin, but as soon as daylight came, she'd make a dental appointment <laughs> to go and see what's wrong with that tooth. And he also knew the dentist. And the dentist, whenever he came in with a problem here, took extra time to see if there weren't any problems anywhere else. And sometimes he found three other areas that were going to need work, and we had a series of appointments until we had perfect teeth. See, the only help that's available was perfect help coming from the mother. He didn't want perfect teeth; he wanted two aspirin, and that's what we want. We want eighty percent, not perfect release from anything. And so, our struggle, as they discuss it. In this becoming entirely ready, takes a long time, and it is the measure of our spiritual progress. What else am I willing to get rid of? There's nothing to learn in spirituality. It is a matter of unlearning. As we completely get rid of everything that isn't us, the truth as. Somebody was quoting the last part of the page 164. More will be revealed, and the revealing is between you and your Creator. That's how it gets revealed. It suddenly occurs to you. You intuitively see things. I know how I could solve this. It just comes effortlessly, no struggle. On our part, we don't like no struggle. We don't like simplicity, and we don't like easy. I don't want it simple. I want it complicated. I remember in the beginning, all you have to do is not drink. That can't be that simple. I know it can't be that simple. I'm a much more cop. Shut up and get in the car, and don't drink. But it was that simple, and it drove me crazy. I'm much more complicated than that. You can't have a simple answer to these complex, complex. And there it lies. And so that's just the perspective I'm throwing on this, because each time that we are willing to surrender through the next step, it talks about humility. The more we awaken. Until we suddenly realize that that I think Bill writes somewhere we were granted a glimpse of the kingdom. You remember that line? We were granted a glimpse. That's all it takes to start making the kingdom the top priority. I want to see more what I just had a glimpse of, and as I'll talk about in the eleventh step, that becomes a personal endeavor. 
the, nobody can pray for you and nobody can meditate for you. And no one can seek our true nature or God. I, I think that seeking our true nature, which is pure love, is the same as seeking God. And the big book tells us that God is inside of us and it's only there that he can be found. And so it is a journey inward which is accomplished by destroying, smashing our story. And so that we're reduced to observers. I'm just here at the movie. Been a hell of a movie. I can't tell you. Boy, I went through this. Oh, here I am being sad again. Oh, yeah, that's a good part. I remember that. Oh, yeah, here's the part where... And... and um. So I just leave it at that, that the struggle there of letting go 100% is, as Bill says, what separates the men from the boys, the girls from the women, the seekers from the hanger-oners. It's possible to, um, yeah, I've got a little extra time because seven won't take very long. I like to use this analogy about AA. You know, a lot of things that um, cause problems for societies are success. Yeah, even our country. You know, it was great while well, you're working and working to get there. Now we all got it and we, everybody's rich and we're sitting around and, I mean, compared to how it was. And then the trouble starts, you know, because I already did the sacrificing. Now I just want to reap. Give me one, give me one, give me one. Um, so if you went back 55 years ago in most cities, in uh, small cities, and all towns, there was one meeting a week. And you say to yourself, how did they stay sober on one meeting a week? One meeting a week? Well, you really look forward to the meeting. <laughs> well, three more days, a meeting will be here. <laughs> So that became quite a big highlight, and maybe halfway through the week you met with another guy or gal for coffee, and the two of you said, three more days, the meeting will be here, and you you can make it, I can make it, you can make it, okay. But what we really did was pray, and prayed like heck, and then prayed some more. Okay, one more day, get me through this day, get me through this day, get me through this day. Ah, I'm at the meeting. So contrast that with today when we have 6 a.m. meetings, noon meetings, 5.45 meetings on the way home from work, 8 o'clock meetings, midnight meetings, gay meetings, women's meetings, men's meetings, discussion meetings, speaker meetings, CDs, tapes, conferences, conventions, pamphlets on everything, everything. <laughs> I'm waiting for one about old marine pilots. I just don't know. Because <laughs> we have very unique problems that need to be... <laughs> Only kidding. Do not call New York and tell them about that comment. <laughs> we have such... And the treatment center and all the professionals that are now involved in alcoholism. We have such a support system now, you don't have to hardly pray at all. <laughs> you don't have to hardly pray at all. And so, that's why I'm focusing on this awakening and taking the goalposts up. You could have pretty good pretty good sobriety sort of going through some of the motions doing some of it giving it a little bit of an effort and then just attending and watching and and you'd be in a semi comfortable position and bill wrote and he's quoting lincoln that the good is the biggest enemy of the best that there is if it would just get worse, we'd really go back and grab this program. But it's, oh, I'm hanging in pretty good. Yeah, I'm yeah, hanging in. I'm, yeah, hanging. How's it going? Pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. How's it going? <laughs> so there's so much more. There's so much more. And then we come to humility. 
in the seventh step. And this, this is a wonderful discussion in the 12 and 12 about what humility is. And we began it with the fifth step with our sponsor. Sometimes people say, if you say you're humble, you're not. It goes away. Well, let me tell you something. If you say a prayer in the morning, that's an act of humility. If you read the big book, that's an act of humility. If you call your sponsor, that's an act of humility. If you go to a a conference, that's an act of humility. All of those are statements by you that you can't make it on your own. That's what all those statements are, which is what humility is. It's an acknowledgement. I can't do this by myself. I can't make it. And then we give up. And we have one of the first paradoxes in spirituality that you win by giving up. And you become totally independent by becoming totally dependent on a higher power. And we have things revealed to us with no effort. We don't have to study. We just have to follow the directions. I would call our AA literature, the big book, I would call it a treasure map. It has precise directions to the treasure. But it is not the treasure itself. The treasure is awakening. The treasure is our creator. The treasure is getting the hell out of this world that we created for ourselves that's so scary and unfair and just filled with all these things. And this process allows it to be destroyed. Piece by piece, as the drinking was. And so in the seventh step, we find something out about humility. Some of the humility is God is everything, I'm nothing. One of the great measures of humility is we don't compare. There's no comparing anything. Nothing is better than or worse than. I'm not better. I just am. It is. They are. No adjectives. Just is. See what I'm saying? The comparison's all gone. The thing about humility and acquiring it in the seventh step is there's a four-letter word involved called pain. And I remember reading that. I said, let's skip to eight. I don't want to hear about pain. I want to hear about pain. Well, I am giving up control, and there's no way to give it up painlessly. All right. I always like it. That's my, when new people say that word, they're being very spiritual. Okay, God do the God do it. All right. That's, yeah. You are getting it now. <laughs> you mean I'm going to give this up too? All right. Boy, if you find yourself saying, all right, you are on a roll. You are on a roll. <laughs> Because you're going against whatever it is that didn't want you to say those words. All right. And so we find, oh, I don't want to go through that again. And that's exactly how Bill puts it. I don't want to go through what I went with the drinking thing. I just don't want to humiliate my friend. I don't want to do that again. All right. And then when we do it, we go, God, that feels better. And our attitude towards Pain and humility starts to change based on the results. And suddenly, pain becomes effort. Just like working out. When you first start, it's painful. But three months later, you're doing the same workout, and it's effort. You don't even classify it as painful. It's producing these results that are so wonderful. And that's the key to understanding humility is that the results that will come from it are indeed magnificent. And so I guess I'm running out of energy. (laughs) I started by saying we're going to look at the steps from just a different storyline, a different perspective. Spiritual beings having a human experience. So the manufactured problems that we ended up drinking over 
weren't there. And the fact that drinking seemed to fix them, as Scott said, it's just an illusion. So we're using this process to crush the illusion, to just have it collapse through examination and through willingness to stop being the author of our life. And when I get to step 11, you'll see, I just want to touch on that now before I wrap up. This is one of the, I've studied a lot of other things, and that's part of what step 11 suggests that we do. And this really is unique, where we are suggested to pray only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry it out. That is the ultimate humble prayer. The prayer is saying, you know much better than I do what would be best for me, so I'm going to leave it all up to you. How do you like that? Because even in our prayers, we have it figured out how it ought to be. And we're going to pray for our way to be implemented. And it may be noble. And it may the motives may look good. But in the final analysis, it's being generated by my view of how things ought to be. And the secret to happiness is to not have a view about how anything should be. It's really the exact opposite of what we were taught. And I'll close with this. When I was a little kid, I was told everything that everybody else was. It's your life, and you have to live it. Nobody else will live it for you. It's up to you to make something out of this world. It's up to you to accomplish this. Well, how do you do that? Well, you go to school. You study hard. You You go over here. You keep your nose clean. And you will get there. And then you're 50 years old on your yacht thinking of suicide. And so, so what they should have told us was, it's not your life. It's God's. Let him make something wonderful out of you. That would have been a nice journey. Thank you all very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.